hoping that that did at least um, identify one uh, key moment of intersection, which was at Cambridge, which is when we first met. Um, so I'm, I mean, I do think that that in a way is part of um, what gave me extra access, I think, to your book, which ranges um, across so many, uh, ex like an extraordinary breadth of subjects. And, um, and I mean, in such an incredibly impressive and exhaustive way, but I'm sure everyone knows what we're, I've got both copies. I'm sure everyone knows what we're talking about here, but you know, Lily's book is um, really a kind of anthology of um, various concerns around climate change um, at this present moment and an investigation, a really voracious and curious investigation of these, of these different solutions that are being proposed and also issues that are confronting our societies. I mean, I, I, I just started to jot some down. It's like we go through fashion, diet choices, conscious consumerism, biotech, protests, indigenous communities, gender disparities, quantum physics, economics theories, uh, universal basic income, ecocide, carbon taxes. I mean, it's really exhaustive. And yet I felt like it actually was an incredibly authentic way of, of tracing your own kind of journey through knowledge acquisition around these subjects. And, um, and I wondered if you could kind of tell me at what point you realized your own sort of path of self-education around some of these issues um, was leading you towards the eventuality of writing a book. Because you were, you know, an art, hist art historian too. I mean, that's where, that's that, that moment when we were much younger and met each other at Cambridge, that's what we were studying. And now you've written this really incredible book about, uh, about climate change and, and, and where we are at this, at this moment in time. Sure. Yes. Um, so yeah, in terms of turning it into a book, um, it was never my intention to write a book. Um, and I just started working in this space, i.e. thinking about kind of social environmental issues, trying to understand them better, trying to understand solutions and how I could be part of solutions. Um, since I was a teenager, really, I was working in fashion and through fashion, two things happened. One is that I was working with businesses and started to feel quite responsible for the businesses I was endorsing as I, as I started to open my eyes to the impacts that some of those businesses and supply chains were having. Um, but also because I suddenly had a kind of profile a little bit through the fashion industry, I was getting contacted by tons of charities asking me to support this cause or this cause or this cause. Um, and so I went through a bit of a phase of trying to work out what I wanted to focus on, what I felt like the biggest issues were to, to, um, to, to deal with and how to do that. And that was like my own kind of journey into into what I write about in the book um, and that's been I mean so I'm still on that journey I'm 32 now and I'm sure in 10 20 years time I'll have different stories to tell but it's been a real journey I guess over the last 15 years studying in fashion then looking at um, technology actually quite a lot and politics quite a lot and in the course of that journey I did one particular project which is like which is very surprising to me actually still that I ended up that I did that but I had an idea to set up an online gift economy platform um, this is in 2010, before Airbnb was famous, before kind of a lot of the what's called now sharing economy platforms were known. Um, and it came up through a conversation with a friend post economic crisis. We were saying, why is it when there's an economic crisis, society falls apart? Because if you think about it logically, we have exactly the same number of real valuable things, i.e. the same number of skills, the same amount of resources. Um, so society should be able to kind of function and yet we've become so dependent on this economic system that we designed that we kind of you know incapacitated without it um, and so we were wondering oh could technology actually kind of provide an alternative way of people to trade skills and services and resources um, so that we're better insulated against economic crises and by virtue of having that idea I then got into the gift economy and the kind of sociology and psychology around the gift economy I was still at Cambridge it was in my last year, year there um, and I got really excited by those possibilities and suddenly found myself post Cambridge diving into the tech world, which I wasn't planning to do and um, feeling like very utopian about technology's possibilities and going on that journey. Um, so was, this is a very- that was, your, was that your, um, your wizard phase? <laughs> that was definitely a wizard phase. <laughs> like we can tech fix our way out of everything. <laughs> um, and um, we should explain the wizard profit paradigm afterwards. We should um, but, um, long answer to say sorry that 
many years after going on that journey, Penguin approached me in the UK, um, some, an editor at Penguin and asked, kind of like, why did you do that? You know, why did you spend several years of your life um, when I did have quite a successful career that I was kind of putting to the side to do it? And a lot of my kind of financial resource and energy and time building this gift economy platform, like what was that about? Um, and I thought, actually, I, you know, there were, there, were so, there was so much research that went into that that I think is still really valuable and valid. Mm -hmm. And it'd be worth writing that, you know, like writing about that. And anyway, that becomes one chapter in the book. What I realized when I started writing it was that there were actually so many other stories to tell and that there are so many other things I'd learned in the last 15 years and, you know, movements I've seen grown and um, ideas I've heard about that make me excited some that I'm more involved with and some that I'm not involved with at all. Like, you know, you talk about quantum, you know, quantum computing. That's just me being geeky and, you know, chatting to quantum computing people and trying to understand how they're trying to fix the problem. So it ended up being, as you say, kind of very, um, bro like much broader anthology of the different ways um, that people are trying to think about so solving our um, social and environmental issues, which I see as fundamentally interconnected. Mm. I think one thing about this book that I think actually makes it so useful, I mean, it's a beautifully written book, I should say, like you're oh, a wonderful you. writer and you, you pull in a lot of disparate things in a, in a really beautiful synthetic way that I feel like actually it feels very tenable as a kind of narrative, but it also feels really like an authentic, I think I already said this, but still a really authentic reflection of your own passage through these subjects and this knowledge acquisition. So it doesn't, even though some of your, um, the visitations that you that you pay to these various technologies or these innovators, whether it's a one day interview or a half day visit, it's like, and maybe it only is a page or two in the course of this book, but it feels not slight at all, actually. It feels like the amalgamation of these, all of these different, um, even brief encounters becomes a real, um, like substantive thesis, even though I know where you stand right now is there's a lot of ambivalence. We still don't really, not ambivalence perhaps, but a lot of confusion around what is the best way to go forward with um, our mm -hmm. choices and our behaviors and our, um, and our businesses and our, and our lifestyles, et cetera. But I guess that kind of leads me to the inevitable question of whether this pandemic moment has affected your thinking around both this book or just in general, um, what kind of shift it's my it's or how it may have shifted your um yeah your what you how you sort of feel about the release both of this book but also its subject matter yeah um i mean the release of the book is like i don't think that interesting because um it is what it is right a book coming out in the middle of a pandemic you can't control it we'll see how it goes it's great i don't have to fly to the us to promote this book because i always felt like a weird contradiction <laughs> um but well, I just wrote a book called Always Home and published it like I know. The, the first month of a pandemic where everyone was always home. So we can say that it doesn't matter, but then there are these sort of like strange almost serendipities that occur. And I know that because I had a copy of your book sitting by my fire at home at the very beginning of lockdown and I made a video of it and I was just like, this is too perfect. <laughs> like you've written the, the title for the moment. Um, but then, but then I, I just feel mean, like this, yeah, this context is just, actually extraordinary for, for this book, you know, I mean, it is an, a, a really uh, sort of fecund backdrop. Well, actually, that's, that's what I was going to go on to say is that actually, I think that the conversation that I'm trying to have with the book feels even more important now. And, um, and I'm not, I don't think I'm being biased in trying to get people to read my book whether you read my book or not, it's like, we have to be having this conversation now. Like the issues I'm writing about and the ideas that I'm trying to touch on um, are so essential for us to deal with um, in one way or another. And it just, and it feels like suddenly we're in this quite dystopian reality where this, this crisis, like the climate crisis that has been talked about for decades and warned about for decades. And I started thinking about, you know, 15 years ago. And even as I was writing the book, the, the scientific reports, I wrote, I wrote it over four years. So the scientific reports were getting more and more scary. And now it's like super real. You know, I know you're in California and around you, there's like crazy forest fires, like the highest recorded temperature ever, I think recorded on earth was recorded mm -hmm. a few days ago in Death Valley. Um, even COVID. And I think that's something that actually quite upset me is that the mainstream narrative hasn't focused enough on like why COVID happened. You read the UN's report on it and it's very clear. It's like the zoonotic diseases um, that are passing from animals to humans, um, three quarters now of infectious 
emerging infectious diseases such as COVID are zoonotic and they're occurring because of, of humanity's relations with the natural world, because of the way we think about animal agriculture, mm -hmm. because of the way we, we are like kind of a, a making wild spaces disappear and um, exploit wildlife. Like th this pandemic is a consequence of our systems. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and actually scientists have been warning about a kind of a pandemic of this nature for some time. So it feels very, very real, um, not to mention obviously the Black Lives Matters movement and thinking about the kind of the systemic injustices that also COVID has like been an x-ray to in terms of social inequality. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel like it's gotten really, really real and the crisis isn't something that's around the corner. It's something that we're actually experiencing right now. And it's on our generation, it's on us right now to, to like step up and go, okay, like, what can we do? You know, how do we get ourselves out of the situation? How do we, how do we unite behind science? How do we listen to warnings? Um, and I think a big um, emphasis of the way I've written the book is also about dialogue. Like no one has this, no one has like the silver bullet. No one knows a kind of magic answer to this complex situation. And so also what we need to do, I think, is be able to be open-minded and realize we're all in this together and, and be in dialogue with one another about how to move through it. I think, you know, one thing that's been interesting about co the, this pandemic, about COVID, is the way that it has laid bare both how interconnected all of these issues are from uh, racial injustice to, you know, uh, to climate change and climate injustice and um, through to everything, to the extent that poverty will plunge you into the worst. Um, you know, experience of this, of this pandemic. Um, and at the same time, it's also, which is something that your book does, I think, given that it's primarily focused on, on climate, there's still a lot of investigation into other things that disenfranchise people and marginalize people, and that those things also play into, um, you know, ac access to good, clean, fair um, in, in an environmental context as well, like these things are indivisible. But it's also laid there the extent to which like our governments have the capacity to do things swiftly and with and and act in really in decisive ways to affect mm -hmm. change positively. I mean, Trump has done the bare minimum, but he's also proven by sending people stimulus check that it's possible to uh, ensure universal basic income, that it is something mm -hmm. that could actually happen. It could happen swiftly if we had the, uh, the intention behind it and the social structure and, and certainly citizen demand for it. And that's something that I think, I mean, there's many points in your book where you talk about how um, citizens, uh, you know, the citizens assembly and this idea of greater individual agency and voting and, and deciding political outcomes. You talk about protest and Extinction Rebellion and how these things actually do move the needle. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about um, sort of the question of behavior change versus system ch systems change. Like, did you come out on one or the other side of that? Because you look pretty um, exhaustively at both what individual behavioral change might do to affect um, little minor, but ultimately perhaps substantial um, changes in, in the environment, but also you look at broad policies. I, I was so struck by, I mean, your book is full of gems, like things I just didn't know, but I like I had no idea that in like 2015, France made it Ill illegal to plan obsolescence in technology or that uh, supermarket chains couldn't waste food. They just had to either donate it or convert it into energy. So they're a little, like keep look out for those little things, readers, um, because there's so many things to learn. But I just wonder if in the end there was, you came out on one or the other side of that debate. Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And it's, I did try and explore both sides of the debate because I think that it's, um, that both, both perspectives are really valid. I certainly don't like uh, the us and them mentality of, you know, somebody who might go to a protest and assume that by protesting, and asking the government to fix it, that all the power is in the government, all the power is in the CEOs, and then not actually take protest home and look at how their daily choices in terms of what they buy and what they eat and how they live is sending a different signal potentially to CEOs and politicians. I think it's really essential that we actually, you know, the old kind of fashioned, be the change you want to see in the world. I think that's really essential. Audrey Lord has a really beautiful quote I put in the book, um, the, the personal is political, like everything you do, whether it's what you eat for breakfast or the way you say hello. And I do, I do really believe that. I think that even from an integrity perspective, we have to start with ourselves because that's the, that's the element we can mm -hmm. control also. 
Um, and then it, if everyone did that, then we see change. And there are examples of that happening, you know, where you do get a kind of public consciousness swell in one direction or another, and it does have a knock on effect to politics or to business. Um, that said, I think if you only take that perspective, it's a kind of terrifying amount of responsibility that we each mm -hmm. carry for an issue that is largely out of our control. And so we also kind of have to be gentle and kind on ourselves because it's impossible to like carry that level of responsibility when the system that we're operating in makes it so difficult to make good choices, mm -hmm. makes it so hard to know what the impact of our choices um, truly is doesn't cost for things like pollution financially so that we're you know often the we're presented as like do you want this like cheap product that's you know fucking over the environment and maybe screwing over its people or do you want this expensive product that's doing everything well like the economics shouldn't work that way um so i do really believe in system change and i think system change is essential like super essential um but i only i think we'll only get system change if there are enough people maybe not everyone but there are enough people doing the personal work to try and push for the system change. And so ultimately I see them as very interconnected and it's a kind of dance between the two. Because luckily, I mean, we don't live in a feudal world. We live in a, most of us, not the whole world, but most of us live in democracies. Most of us live in a kind of global capitalist framework where actually politicians are answerable to citizens. Like we do have ways to exercise political power. Um, and even like super powerful businesses and CEOs and companies are completely dependent on their customers. So we actually do have quite a lot of power as individuals working together collectively. Um, and I think it's important that we exercise that to get the system change we need. God, that's all. I'm, I'm such an invigorating answer that I'm always like, ah, oh, the lobbies, which you do talk about too, like just the extent and the power of lobbies. I mean, mm -hmm. we have these just hypertrophied, absolutely like dysfunctional institutions that we, that govern us. I mean, when you think America, the extent to which America now is in this, in the, in the midst of just a kind of collapse of just epic proportions from this pandemic handling through to the ex really the extent of racial injustice that's plagued this country I means it's really laying bare just how sort of broken our institutions are and even the system to correct it. I mean, right before we started talking publicly, we were just, you know, you and I were just talking about how I've been sitting in on these local council meetings with, um, with the mayor of Berkeley. And this is like a small progressive town. And they, this was about budget reform to try and reallocate police budget, or at least part of it elsewhere into mutual um, aid organizations that would actually help people um, in a more substantive way and communities that need them. And the budget still barely shifted at the end of all of these like public comments, hundreds of people showing up and in very coherent, intelligent ways, decrying the system, offering sub offering really considerable and well-researched alternatives and still it's just a kind of glacial and and broken political system it's incredibly frustrating um and it's why i think having people who are who become these kind of icons of a certain um kind of the, the gretas for instance of the world and also to some extent my mom you know my mom is a, an insane ideologue and she's so uncompromising i mean very um She's, in, she's probably the most rigorous person I know in, in a way. And I remember her a couple of years ago, I was, I was like talking to her because I'm much more pragmatic than she is. And I started talking to her about how, um, I was like, mom, I just feel like you around the edible schoolyard, which is her foundation that plants gardens and schools and integrates them into the classroom um, pedagogy, uh, which is something that's expanded globally. And she's become a, a, a agriculture justice pioneer, um, food justice pioneer, and racial justice pioneer as a result because these programs are in the public schools. And I was like, you have to work, I think I was advocating more for like working in a more collaborative way with the institution. And she's like, no, we have to go around it. Like she, de she demonstrated to me like walking towards them and did an about face and walked away. She's like, the, the system is broken. Like they don't, they mm. we can't actually interface in this way. Um, we just need to go underground. We need to do other things. We need to create our own solutions. And I, I don't know if you, when you interviewed her, if you touched on any of that, but I wonder what you make of this, the idea of trying to collaborate. I mean, you, you definitely do Ooh. speak about this in the book, but collaborating from within versus not being able to do something from within, which I think to some extent you found with the, the challenges that arose around impossible versus just trying to um, mm -hmm. circumnavigate 
or, or find subterranean or underground methods to, to create or affect the change that you want to see. That's interesting. Um, we're doing a, we've, we've, I've worked on a podcast to go out alongside the book. It's had one episode last week and the episode that comes out next week, um, your mum is in because it's on food. So I've included some of the audio from her um, interview on food. And I mentioned that to say, I'd love to get her on another episode because I'm going to do an episode purely on this question because it was a really central part of the book. Um, do, can you change your system from the inside? Or does it need to be from the outside? And I think it's a question I have personally grappled with um, since I was a teenager and I made the decision, I made a very conscious decision, I remember, to try and make change from the inside, to like stay within those industries and work within business and technology um, and capitalism and try and like do things better from the inside. And there have been many times where I felt um, defeated by that and that maybe it's not possible, you know, to change things from the inside and maybe you do have to um, Look at look from an external perspective, and towards the end of the book, that's one of the reasons I spend so much time looking at indigenous communities and what we can learn from them, because I think they bring an outsider perspective that will allow us to realize that our system is a system. You know, it's not the only way that human beings can live, have lived, um, can choose to live, and that there are alternatives we can look to. So I haven't answered the question um, for myself. <laughs> um, I think I. I kind of still try and cha make change from within because somehow the idea of changing from the outside feels scary and daunting. I don't know how to do that. And it makes me think of like historically like revolutions, which have always been really like bloody and violent and have often mm. been usurped by something even worse afterwards. So um, I'm like still hoping that we can evolve the systems we have. And actually I would say in my last 10, 15 years working in this space, one of the main reasons for my optimism, it really does feel like the systems are evolving in a better way. Um, mm -hmm. I was in Davos at the beginning of the year and I hadn't been for six or seven years. And it was really phenomenal to see the shift that the business world has made. I'm not saying it's enough and I'm not saying it's not a lot of greenwashing, but the fact that they're talking about stakeholder capitalism and the fact that, you know, the idea that business shouldn't only be responsible to shareholders, it needs to think about kind of other stakeholders mm -hmm. is a huge shift. Um, yeah. The green kind of the green messaging and the carbon commitments that were being made are, are profound um I'm not saying they're enough but it's watching those shifts happen gives me hope that actually we we have evolved our systems in the past you know and actually i would say that to your point about feeling defeated and i totally get that um i've felt defeated many many times by different things i've worked on um but actually if you look historically at the amount of progress we've made in the last few hundred years um, we've made extraordinary social progress, whether it's, you know, the emancipation of women or making slavery illegal. And all of those momentous changes were not one top down. They were one grassroots by people who persevered and persevered and persevered, often at huge, great personal sacrifice um, to see change happen in the world. And that gives me great hope, you know, that actually there is a lot of the, as Greta Thunberg would say, the power belongs to the people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think we're, I mean, I think we're seeing that in the U.S., like the sustained commitment to protest in, in the wake of um, George Floyd's killing and, and other very uh, unjust uh, black death in this country, which has been obviously an, an issue for ever, <laughs> forever, the history of this country. But to see the extent to which in the last six months there has just been this um, from all walks of life, you know, it's not just been a small, uh, interest, you know, interested group. It's been people who are waking up to this, um, to these realities. For in some instances, I think for the first time, it feels different. You know, I've been, I've been in participating in Black Lives protests, not, you know, but Black Lives Matter protests for years now, or at least the last five years. But this time does actually feel different. It feels like there's potential for some real, actually, substantive change. And even if that just comes in the form of you know, a uh, massive voter turnout in, in November, that will already be something that pushes the needle and, or at least promises something different will, will come in these next four years. Mm -hmm. Fingers very crossed for that. Um, mm. Be interesting but, to learn a bit more about, because um, I interviewed, as you know, um, Mayor Tubbs for the Universal Basic Income ex um, pilot that he's set up in Stockton, California. And I know your mom has been working with him. It may be interesting to learn a bit more about any insight you have on both your mom's work with him and also the universal basic income pilot that's going on there. 
I, I found the, the introduction of your discussion of universal basic income to be a really compelling part of the book because I do think it has such a profound relationship to, even in this knock-on way, to all of these issues that we're discussing, just the power even an agency to make certain decisions uh, around your lifestyle and your, I mean, that nothing, you're not deciding necessarily based on the most urgent need, but because you have some um, safety. And I think, you know, one of the things that's very difficult, I think, probably for you and also for myself is we're coming from pretty privileged uh, backgrounds and perspectives. And it's easy for us to make decisions to even pay to carbon offset a flight or, I mean, I loved actually your admission of like trying to find another way back from, was it Stockholm or Copenhagen mm -hmm. where you were okay. for to yeah. Stockholm to see Greta um, speak and you were like, I'm not flying back. And you took four days of trains and then you missed your last connection and finally decided rather than spend a night in an ex expensive hotel that you would fly back and offset the carbon, even though the flight probably was about the same duration as the initial flight you would have taken. And just, you know, that, that it did, like, that you came up, uh, up against a lot of the, first of all, you have the flexibility to do that, to opt out of the, you know, to fly there in the first place, then to make the decision to correct your trajectory on the back and, and on the back, on the return journey. And then ultimately to, be foiled and have to spend money on this thing and then to decide that you're doing that and then to be able to afford the carbon offsetting and and just your admission of guilt and also complicity and in, in it I think was really powerful because it is I mean it is where you are it's where you sit in this in this discussion it's where I sit too you know it's a place of not having ever felt a kind of you know desperation really and and I think the extent to which um, universal basic income and the introduction of that idea is for, and in the newest iteration of the Green New Deal, it's a fundamental part of how we talk about climate change and, and, uh, and yes, social justice around climate change is by introducing this idea of, of security, of financial mm -hmm. security. Um, which somehow I, I sort of, I mean, I, sorry, I got a little off track from Meritabs. I mean, it's a great program. And I don't know how, to what extent my mom is involved in that part of the Stockton program, but they are, he's very interested in making Stockton have edible school yards at all of the school, public schools there. Um, mm -hmm. And I also know that at the beginning, my mom helped liaise with, um, with Tubbs to get vegetable boxes from local farms to all the families in dire need in Stockton, in the Stockton area that also had uh, recipes and then for how to cook the vegetables and um, which was part of a philanthropic uh, effort that she and Tubbs coordinated with Mayor Tubbs. But I, I'm interested in how, in a way, universal basic income relates to this idea of people, not, it's sort of tenuously to the gift economy notion, but really to cooperation and how cooperation is something that we do not just because it's um, compassion or it's good for someone else, because, but also because it helps us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very, I mean, giving money to people, to the people who are most in need in this country or any, also actually has the effect of making even the wealthiest people who, whose, whose income might be taxed to do so more prosperous, not less. I mean, those people then have the freedom to participate in the economy in such a way as there are usually generally more positive effects um, more broadly. And I think that's, that can also be felt in, as it really relates to climate change. Sorry, this is a little bit of a, a bloated question, but I think if you could talk a little bit to, about that idea of how cooperation is also, is something that's intensely symbiotic, not just sort of monodirectional. Yeah, I mean, we are, I think, fundamentally a cooperative species. Um, I had, um, like I was spending time with horses, this is a random answer, but I was spending time with horses last month. Um, it was my daughter's birthday and she was really into like wanting a pony, so we were spending more time with horses. And there were these two horses, like one pony, one horse that were bonded. And I would try and take one of them out by itself and it would kick up the biggest fuss you can ever imagine. And I realized they were just, they just wanted to be together, right? And you, you, if you were taking one, you have to take both, period. Um, and I don't think humans are that dissimilar, you know? I think we've atomized ourselves in many ways and insulated ourselves through the systems that we've built and the comforts and the, you know, the, the economic system too. Like, our, and I think one of my biggest problems with our economic system is the psychological impact it has of making us all kind of against each other in a way, you know, 
um, building a system where people are going to lose. You know, there are winners and there are losers, and we're all fighting to not be the losers. And um, almost like on some psychological level, like battling it out between businesses and between um, jobs, etc let alone the kind of inequality and hierarchy and competitivity that brings. Um, and I think that that's not a natural human way that actually, if you look back at the kind of earliest human societies for tens, most anthropologists would say hundreds of thousands of years, we existed as gatherer hunter com communities that were much more cooperative in nature through the gift economy, through favors, through bartering, through trading. Um, and I think that's a more human instinct. And actually it's interesting in a crisis like COVID, how at least in the UK, it was very palpable, the, the grassroots community response, that people, there was such a wellspring of sharing and kindness and cooperation that got tapped, that we didn't descend into some kind of like selfish dystopian society that we're all fighting with each other, that actually in crisis, we come together. And Rebecca Solnit writes a lot about that in her work. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of historical examples of that happening. So my point is that I think that cooperation and community are like fundamental human needs. And, and I think that the psychological and sociological impact of feeling a sense of belonging to community, feeling a belonging to a group, feeling relationships with other people, feeling that people have your back and that you have their back, getting supported is really profound, but we can't quantify it and we can't measure it. So we don't, you don't measure it as a poverty in the way that you would measure financial poverty, for example, but it is a poverty in a way. Um, and actually one of the things I really liked about what Mayor Tubbs said about universal basic income in his Stockton um, experiment of it was about community. And actually he'd been inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, who'd written about universal basic income. Yeah. And, you know, towards, I think it was his last book, he said he thinks that's the way to eradicate, the best way to eradicate um, poverty. But he'd also written about it in terms of community and that when people are not struggling to meet their basic needs, when they have a kind of base level of security, then they have more time and capacity to be yeah. part of community. And, um, and also to like, to take the time to do work that is not counted by the system. You know, that's not, you're not getting paid for, that's not adding to GDP, but is meaningful work, whether that's looking after your kids or looking after grandma or playing the piano because you want to play the piano or you know, gardening because you yeah. want to garden, like all the other stuff of life that's valuable. Um, well, wait, remind me which country it was. Was it Bhutan that, that came up with the notion of gross domestic happiness? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I loved that notion. I mean, like these things that you do get into, I think, and especially in the last uh, third or quarter of the book, this idea of precisely what you're speaking about, but this economy of intangibles, which is around a kind of sense of well-being and which also allows you to engage in your network in a much more profound way. I mean, people, you talked um, really compellingly about this idea that actually there's a pretty direct quantifiable quantifiable connection between the hours that we work and the emissions that we create. So mm -hmm. working the at this frenetic pace and this insane number of hours that we've come to can normalize in the 21st century actually has a tangible, uh, and, you know, yeah, go ahead. And also politically, there is just this like insistence over and over again in different countries around the world on jobs and jobs and jobs and like lowering unemployment and creating jobs and that being the most important thing possible. It's obviously tied to GDP and growing GDP. Um, without like, and that has, I think, multiple effects, the kind of psychological effects we're talking about, but it also has uh, carbon effects. It also has environmental effects that we are trying to continue to grow this economy at any cost to just keep growing because the economic growth is the most important thing. Um, and actually slowing that down and saying, like, of course, like we need a functioning economy, but there are also other metrics that are really important to consider, like happiness, like health, like the, having a healthy environment. And actually, can we find a more balanced way of, of kind of measuring them out against each other um, so that we're not driving ourselves to oblivion? I don't know if that makes sense, but- No, it, it, can, it completely does. Yeah. Um, and also I think it's, you can take that on a like political level, you know, like the way I've just done in talking about like, what is, what is the political framework we're chasing? Is it GDP or is it GDP plus all these other metrics we want to think about measuring for? And actually there are some countries like New Zealand, for example, I think have just made some great strides in terms of balancing GDP against like mental health of community. Um, but, um, but I also think on a personal level, we can think about that, which is like, you know, what do we really want from our lives? 
And of course, you come from a position of privilege to be able to ask that question. And that's why things like universal basic income are interesting, because if you're just trying to survive, you don't have the space and the time necessarily yeah. to, to ask those questions. But if you're in a position to ask those questions and say, actually, like, what's the most important thing for me to get out of life? I have like, you know, 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, or however long you think you have, you know, it's diminishing every day. Like, what do I want to get out of it? Um, and for sure, like financial security will probably be part of that because no one wants to feel uh, their basic security threatened. I mean, that's essential. But beyond that, I feel like there are many other values we can think about focusing on, whether it's community or friendship or meaningful work or healthy environment, um, connection to nature. And they'll be different for different people. But thinking about a more holistic, um, mm -hmm. I guess, maybe approach to life um, would both maybe make us happier and also help solve our environmental crisis. I mean, because we are not disconnected from nature, as you like, as you definitely point out in the book, but which is something that um, there's a wonderful David Attenborough quote about how we can really uh, seek solace and feel solace in, in nature because we are not separate from it. We are part of nature. And mm -hmm. that being reminded of that fact is one of the key, I think, um, revelations sort of personal revelations and, and community revelations and really global revelations to getting back uh in in harmony with it so that we're not thinking of it as something to exploit or extract things from but um something that when we extract and exploit we we are actually ravaging ourselves too which i think mm -hmm. is which um i mean all of this ties into this question too of gdp that doesn't account for the fact that you might have very wealthy nation but one that's extremely environmentally poor you know and that those things um have historically up to this point um been in direct correlation we need there are ways and you do also point out many ways and many innovations that are looking at taking um at resting power away from the more destructive practices and investing in everything from i mean carbon capture and turning carbon into diamonds or into basalt or um so that's basalt, not bath salts, which would be a particularly alarming uh, innovation. But just, um, you know. It wouldn't work very it, well. You'd put them in the bath and it would go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'm no scientist, which is clear. Um, maybe, I don't know if we have any questions, which are kind of coming up on that moment. I have plenty more things that I can ask you. But there was this one quote when you were, um, in conversation with, I think, someone in the Sunrise Movement named Marissa, is that right? And uh, you ask her if she's optimistic, and she says, my mom always tells me the saying, quote, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Mm. And she says, and then she says, action really is the best antidote to despair, which I thought was such a compelling summation in a way. Um, and I feel like you've obviously really been taking action in the course of writing this book and just educating yourself, which is the very first thing that we can do is understanding these issues better, knowing really what's at stake. And I think, you know, you talk in a really compelling way too about um, how we've had so much sort of fear mongering happening in the news that we have actually sort of almost become inured and also hardened. And I think um, there's a sense of despair too around these issues and you get overwhelmed, you know, there's a, a neologism that you introduced called solastalgia, which is um, summing up the devasta devastating effects of finding unease where you used to look for relief, but specifically the anguish that's caused by environmental alterations um, from climate change. And I think that's actually a very poignant thing that we're all sensing right now. We feel that whether we know it or not, you know, and um, this book also does, I mean, true to its title, it does introduce an, a number of positive things that are happening in a whole number of industries from tech to um, you know, climate science and um, environmentalism and, and activism. And I think if only to be better educated in, because I feel like a lot of people who, a lot of my friends who are pretty well versed in the devastating effects of climate change are at least enlightened still don't really know kind of what good is happening you know and i i felt very thankful for this book as a result of some of um those introductions to the to the things that feel if not like perfect solutions like at least steps in the right direction so anyways if you have any audience questions we can maybe take those um otherwise I have a question for you before we take them. Sure, <laughs> of course. Um, Shoot. 
as you are surrounded by fires right now, um, and as your mum is such an environmental activist in her own in her own way, as I understand, do you have an opinion through your own exposure to, to these dialogues for quite a long time on what you feel are like the most important steps that we can take? Um, I think the ones that obviously uh, I've been most exposed to have to do with diet and food and uh, relationship to stewardship of the land um, and also to education. And so my mom's work has been primarily in um, primary school level education um, at, a, at a public school level um, in California in the beginning, but now throughout various states across the US and then also internationally with the aim of, of introducing to children when they're quite young what it means to take care of the land and each other. So it's very much a kind of Montessori pedagogy, um, but that has this kind of, uh, these deeply held beliefs around sustainability and our connection to the earth um, interwoven into the, into the curriculum. So that's to me felt like a critical point. I mean, you don't talk too much about education, like how that might be the, a paradigm shift. Um, when I get into just sort of despairing about the US, it often falls on this question of how um, impoverished our public education system and how unjust it is, um, both access to quality education, but just the, the degradation of this institution over the last 50 years, 60 years has been um, sort of horrifying. And our schools are among the worst um, public schools in the world, you know, despite us being one of the <laughs> wealthiest nations in the world. So I think it comes down first to really introducing children in what my mom would describe as a very kind of uh, sensuous way where they're very, where they are actually exposed to the beauty of the natural landscape and understand the very direct action of farming and then cultivating and then harvesting um, food and then cooking it for one another. I mean, it is actually a very basic, very human, sort of almost coded into, into these kids and they feel it um, and connect with it immediately. So I think when they have that at that educational level, then it becomes easier to make the choices around how they're going to live um, and be accountable to their consumerist options, whether it's you know deciding not to eat meat, which we all know now would have a tremendous impact if we all opted out of, or at least even partially opted out of eating meat. Um, especially in the United States where it's such a huge feature still of most people's diets. So my mom, you know, is not a vegetarian, even though um, they introduced um, vegetarian menus, entirely vegetarian menus at, at the restaurant, her restaurant Chez Fins, which will be 49 years old this week. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they have, this has been actually kind of a groundbreaking thing since it was in the wake of um, Jonathan Safran Philly's book, eating animals, or no, it was, actually, it was kind of eating animals and we are the weather. When she read We Are the Weather, she was like, we have to do something. Even if Chez Panisse is buying, um, you know, very uh, regenerative and sustainable pro meat products, like it's, it's not enough to just practice it. There's also an important symbolic aspect to say, this is an, a restaurant that's defined uh, some, at least for many, to find the sort of, um, culinary vanguard in this in this country it should all it should show that it's possible to do it in a way that's entirely plant-based you know that we can have beautiful food at the same level without the need for meat and I think that kind of that's a major thing for the restaurant to have undertaken and I think it's a major thing that for all of us to consider is is just um and which when did I the restaurant do that this last summer of nice. course, the restaurant's yeah. closed currently, so yeah. things have been thrown into some degree of chaos. But yeah, just around the time, actually, I think Jonathan's book party at the restaurant was the first of the oh, wow. of nice. the vegetarian menus. So yeah, I loved his book. I, I did a talk yeah. about it recently. It's an amazing book. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. I just and actually, there are many things I found between your book and his that that you know this approach this really pragmatic and kind of optimistic approach which is that we actually have a lot of power and agency in this it's not hopeless. well food is the really interesting one because it's like you know talking about energy systems and banking and all these things is really important but it's very hard to make change individually on those mm -hmm. levels and it's you can do it and you should try to but it's hard to whereas changing what you eat is literally like a decision that everyone can make tomorrow 
Um, yeah. And if everyone makes that decision more mindfully, or at least a large portion of people do, that would have a like transcendent effect overnight. Um, so it gives me a lot of hope. I think one of the important things on that front is also it's getting clarifying the extent to which it's not elitist to make those decisions and actually mm -hmm. it's much it can be much cheaper and really economical and still incredibly nourishing to eat vegan or mm -hmm. mostly vegan you know and I think it's and then I think that again comes back to kind of people being educated around food and just from a younger age having a connection to um to the earth you know. It's interesting when you said it, we were answer around education, I suddenly have part of me that's like, oh my God, you're totally right. I didn't do a chapter in education. It's so <laughs> Girl, you did, you did good. <laughs> you covered a lot of territory. <laughs> that was not a recrimination or a no, sway. I, I know, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but you just suddenly opened my mind. So I'm like, whoa, that's a huge topic. I didn't really spend much time on. You're not, um, you know, you're not spoken but, 10 years. Okay. You can take a little break. <laughs> but what I would say actually to that point is what I, I did put like quite a lot of emphasis in the protest chapter on the idea of like that instead of us teaching our children, although I completely agree we should be, be more mindful about what, what we're teaching our children, us learning from our children and seeing it like seeing it flow that way, right? Which is like actually the children are leading the world in many ways right now and we need to listen to them. Um, so it was a kind of inverse education. The education of the adults really that needs to happen. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> Annie, I, I would take I would take Greta as president. I'll tell you, a child is president right now. Well, Greta's pretty exceptional, but I would take any elementary school student as president <laughs> over Trump. Anyways, sorry. Should we yes, we have a few questions? We we have one question, which is the perfect amount of questions from the audience. So this is from Damien. He asks, in terms of personal responsibility how much rests on reducing consumerism and what will it take when consumers have been trained so well to consume? Mm. Um, how much rests on reducing consumerism? Uh, I think a lot rests on reducing consumerism, but it's, but we still, I don't think it's like, I don't see it as like an absolute, like never consume anything again. The reality is we still do have to consume food, like realistically um we do still have to consume energy you know even if we waste less and actually david attenborough his one piece of advice when you ask him what what can any individual do to try and help is stop waste like reduce the amount you're wasting food energy etc um so consume less but we still do need to consume some um and even you know the industry i come from fashion i'd say there is a case that there are some versions of fashion that still make sense to exist um partially because that's what people want and you know we're not going to turn into a totalitarian dictatorship probably tomorrow um but also things that, that are quite practical like underwear <laughs> um i have an eyewear company and i feel okay about that because actually eyewear is something that does get scratched and does need to be you know optical lenses need to be made there are, so there are, there are versions of things that i think are justifiably made new um so whilst we are still making stuff can we make it better is the question can we change the way we're doing business can we change supply chains can we look at you know, agriculture being a really important example, we all need to eat. So whilst we're making food, can we make it in a way that is actually like improving soil quality, regenerating land, as opposed to destroying, um, you know, destroying soil and creating loads of carbon emissions. Um, so I guess, sorry, the simple answer would be consume a lot less, um, but when we are gonna consume, consume better. Um, and in terms of being kind of brainwashed into being consumers, I mean, it's a really good point and it's still happening all the time, right? That we're just getting constant messaging to. Um, persuade us to buy more and be more and I think that goes back to kind of what we were saying about other values right and realizing that actually you know really trying to do the internal work of like what makes us happy and retail therapy only goes so far right to making someone happy that actually and COVID's been quite interesting I remember a friend saying to the end of it like what did you miss in the last few months like you probably missed hugging a friend you didn't miss shopping you know you didn't miss a new dress and so I think thinking about actually like resisting all the messaging we get and thinking about happiness and what makes us feel good, which is probably around integrity and liking who we are as people and relationships and other ways to spend your time would then help push against the consumerist narrative. Thank you so much, Lily and Fanny. Um, and thank you for being a great audience. Uh, Let's get off that consumer kick once I tell you to buy the book again, please. From <laughs> <laughs> um, and this has been 
Excellent. Thank you. It's, uh, I think it's, I remember when I spoke to Rizzoli originally, it's FSC paper. So it is being made in a responsible way. Um, or there's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. It was so nice to speak with you. Can't wait oh, to see so nice you soon. to see you too. It's um, it's midnight where I am, so I hope I'm yes. Being time eloquent. for bed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good night. Good night. And thank you so much for having us, Kim Nelly Jackson.